this conversation is fun because it's bringing me to something I haven't thought about in a very long time. Yeah. Thought about? Sorry, thought about in a long time. Yeah. Uh, that's... I like learning in this way. I think uh, having inputs and discussions and then outputs with other people solidifies all these things. Like for me, I can bring up this memory very easily. <laughs> Largely because we already had the discussion of this multiple times. Uh, this happened about four days ago with someone. Yeah, and then the original discussion about uh, dropping nose and stuff talk about fossilized fossilized nose and whatnot occurred over uh over two weeks ago like with lotus yeah so you, you can kind of still get away with uh saying like if someone was telling you this and then you needed to tell someone what this person is saying right because i'm always talking about from the interpretive perspective perspective so like if you had a japanese friend who's saying something to your english friend and then you, your English friend asks you, what did this person just say? You can technically say all of these things to the person. Uh, you can probably say either of these and this and the kind of the core essence of it would be enough for the English person if you're interpreting. But this would be very functionally purposeful when you say, oh yeah, that person wants to buy a battery for the computer. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I think that's both a bane in um, both a con and a pro, both pro and con, in the dual lingo's design is I personally think they second. This is a secondary priority. For me, the way uh, dual lingo leaves out context, ironically, is the reason why I get deep into these contexts. But for most people, they want explicit instructions. So naturally, if uh, Duolingo was able to contextualize most of these things, like really contextualize it, then it would slow down the process, but also it would give much more information. And the, the people who like that would need to slow down and take even more time to take in more information, right? So that might not be Duolingo's bottom line, right? For me, because it leaves this out, it challenges me to find all the context in which uh, these things can be interpreted. So we're having this discussion largely because Duolingo didn't explain to me and prescribe to me what this is because I like to think about the things that are given to me. But no, that is not representative of most people who use this. So their comprehension, I agree with most people, to benefit from uh, having like a humongous like text document with like three paragraphs about, um, oh yeah, these are the no uses, you know, but I learn as I go. So if they continue to introduce new no peculiarities, I'm like, all right. I guess I'll go find out and try to explain it to myself how this is slightly newer than the other ones and say, wait, this doesn't really check out and kind of puts a kink in my interpretation of it. That kind of thing. I actually think that's kind of fun. It's like a video game. Like, well, that doesn't work anymore. You, you know what I mean? Like um, when you're playing a game, you come up with a solution. You're like, oh yeah, I'm doing good. And then the developer tries their best to slam a uh, uh, slam a obstacle in your way is like nah 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 you got to rethink this my friends that that logic that doesn't pull up you got to make like you've made a mistake here <laughs> that kind of thing so that's kind of how i treat this all, all these discussions mean like wait you know okay my strategy doesn't work anymore yeah like nah nah that's not quite right <laughs> An interesting part of the way I learn, mostly spoken and living experiences, I'll often run into situations where I have trouble translating the Japanese to English because I just know the feeling. Yes. Um, have I already told you about this? Um, before I met you yesterday, I talked about this phrase that I use a lot. Immersion baby. Oh yeah, the witness. I know. Like, puzzle, good, great puzzle games do it so well. It's a really good. Oh, you thought you knew the rules. You didn't. Yeah. So 
I used this phrase before. I'm not sure if it was before I met you or after, but I've been using this phrase called immersion baby where um, you don't have to necessarily be born into it, but there comes a time when you feel something. However, when you um, don't practice enough, um, practice enough like association between languages right that happens a lot this is why i call it the immersion baby situation where you don't practice enough associations when you go to interpret something right when you go to interpret something how useful is this skill to me i have to do this every day however for other people this might not need you might not have to be in interpretation mode all the time so what happens is if you become really proficient in another language sometimes you just feel like okay this might you know i don't know how to express this but you're gonna try your best but it's not quite right right and you don't really know at the moment how you're gonna interpret it but you're gonna try your best anyway and this that feeling that you're describing the whole like where you have trouble translating from Japanese to English because I just know the feeling of the Japanese. That's every day. Whenever my parents and I go out and we have to take care of business or do bills, mail, like any type of uh, English related thing. It's uh, the interpretation to the best of ability to capture a feeling as opposed to to capture a feeling as opposed to uh, nerding it out in the specifics. Um, someone, oh, Subway, uh, Subway, Sub-Zero. Uh, Sub-Zero talked to, uh, by the way, uh, Sub-Zero is the one that, which you just came by here. He, he is learning, he's going to go learn Mandarin, much like yourself. Um, uh, we taught we had a bunch of time i don't know if you were here beforehand but right before we yesterday before we talked sub zero and i were exchanging ideas about the immersion baby thing where uh we described that situation where um i get a phone call right i get a phone call from my parents sorry sub zero i called you subway <laughs> sub zero um i get a phone call from my parents and then, you know, it'd be like a two hour phone call. And then someone would ask me, like my roommate would ask me like, well, oh, what did you say? And it would take me like five seconds to summarize a two hour phone call because it's the essence, right? So how do you capture the essence of the English from all the conversations of the language that I use with my parents, my Fujonese? And you can appropriately already filter through those things like okay this person doesn't want me to explain like explain the exact word for word translation of the two hours of things it's what is the essence of the two hours through the natural filter the natural filters that you understand in the context of that question in english Right. So like I wasn't if I was in the doctor's office and there's like this uh, gastroenterologist telling me the fine points of a specific detection method and it's like false positives and it's detection limits for my father's potential digestive problem. I would not express all of that in Fujianese to my father. I would express the essence of why he asked me that question first place and then that's how i would interpret it so that's kind of like a different aspect of translation versus um uh, it's interpretation it's less about translating it's more about interpreting i went from thinking it was going to be impossible for me to not think in english and translate use english in my head to being able to swap into japanese and never have english exist at all Okay, and that's when I learned that translation and interpretation is a skill that doesn't come for, for free. Yes. Agreed. Living in America now, I'm getting a lot better at the sense I have to translate interpret for my partner, but some situations I'm very... Yeah, 
exactly. And um, I found ways to use uh, Familex. So uh, since you have a partner, Shady, um, for my parents and I, I have Familex. Familex that are a combination of Fujianese, Fujianese and English. To uh, because of a recurring experience, lots of recurring experiences, I develop Familex that captures a specific thing that I can't express in English, but needs to integrate these two meanings. And my parents do it too. And actually, in Fujianese, it became things like borrowed words. Borrowed words in English has become part of Fujianese, and these are now even more so common that these Familex aren't even specific to me specifically, but specific to Fujianese American household. So eventually Familex can become so prevalent that they reach a point where things like the word busy, I use this a lot, like busy, nie busy ma, uh, nie e, e busy, busy ma, nie busy ma, that's um, the actual phrase of asking if someone is busy. As in, what are you doing? And it's not literally asking you if you're busy. It's asking, um, are you free? Are you free? How are you doing? How have you been doing? How have you been doing? There, there, it means a lot of things. Nia busy ma means a lot of things. And these are the consequence of Familex. You can't directly translate these things, but it is a combination of English and Fujianese. That's kind of how I would describe after interpreting for so long for people, you pick up these things, which is neither Fujianese or English. It's a combination of the two. I'm much better at going from English to Japanese than the other way around. Ah, I see. I think it comes from basically having the feeling of nearly every possible English expression ingrained in me and a familiarity with any way to express that. I see. Whereas from Japanese, there are emotional feelings I simply don't know how to express in English, so I freeze up. Ah, yeah. Oh, when you go to the doctor, I approach it the same way with your partner. I see. Yeah, there's a lot of random stuff like that, which only makes sense in a small in small groups. Yeah. Like, um, that's kind of how I feel about when you, I don't know if you felt that before your partner, but I feel like that is a very different perspective. If you're constant living in a state of multilingual usage, as in it's different in my opinion from a polyglot who is, uh, swapping for pragmatic uses. I, I mean, like. They, they get challenged based on their uh, proficiency in that language a lot of times. And when you're in a job, it's in that language outside of interpreters, like outside of the way of interpretation and having to live with the idea that you have incomplete knowledge and you have to improvise. Eventually you develop Familex regardless if you intuit it or not. Like when I say school, I don't say school how how anymore i say school and so whenever i say oh i have a uh, school work it'd be a combination of school and work which work is in fujianese and school is in english so and that's kind of the way in my opinion to offset that whole you know what i don't really know how to express this like i don't know how to express this to my parents, to my parents. So over time, you kind of build up, build up your own phrases, your own phrases to um, communicate that over time because it comes with experience. And that's kind of how I feel about when you truly command a language, in my opinion, when you truly command a language, you, you can construct and create with that language as well. And so, like, not necessarily based on rules, but like, for example, inside jokes, the closet, um, pep, old, ain't Norway. That's kind of, in my opinion, that's the essence of interpretation. Because you're always constantly interpreting, uh, interpreting, uh, interpreting, <laughs> interpreting 
even in your native language. Like uh, having someone explain to me what the word slap means now, right? That's an interpretation. Now, even in your native language or even in your target language, if you're constantly talking in your car uh, target language, you still have to do interpretation in your own language. So I think that's sweet. And it's so exaggerated and pronounced when your significant other or your family members constantly provide this challenge. So while people are constantly talking about like, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. And then like focus on the nuance. It's like, I live with that. It's, it's okay. You can, you can say that to me, but, but you have to know that I don't feel the same way about how you're trying to constantly separate things. I totally get the idea. I think Duolingo in itself gets a challenge all the time with like, oh, but this is translation based learning and stuff it's like well yeah i get it but i'm also a minority as in like what i mean is my natural state of being is seeing two languages at the same time right seeing two languages at the same time so a lot of people ask me things like oh do you translate in your head all the time like are you thinking in english or are you thinking in fujianese and the question I often ask them is like both instantaneously. Like what I mean is it could be something like Nia busy ma is the moment I needed to say an English word, it becomes English. The moment I need to say a Fujianese word, it becomes Fujianese. Am I translating it? Do I think Nia busy ma, do I think of the whole sentence in English or do I think of the whole sentence in Fujianese? And that's so hard to describe. That feeling is so hard. Like, yes and no. Somehow I knew that it was a great place to put in an English word, uh, put in an English word here and it'd be okay and not. You found that it's feeling that you take the path of least resistance to communicate is that instant without any thought. Yeah. Yep. You found that it's a feeling in your brain takes the path of least resistance. Yeah. I actually think when people talk about natural, when they use the word natural acquisition, that to me is the essence of my natural acquisition. Not necessarily the natural acquisition where when someone said like oh yeah but sometimes uh, you get that point where you start thinking in the other language as in you start thinking in your target language i get that i i suppose i actually really don't think so so when i started saying things recently like you know uh, when i'm reading someone's slowly but surely when it, the moment if someone types a japanese phrase that i know all the vocabulary it comes out without a second thought. So yes, you get that moment. But immediately when I read that, I'm also thinking about the English. Because I'm more used to the context where when I read something in a language, I also ask myself if I can interpret it in the other language. Not that I want to live and immerse myself in the language. Like if I'm speaking in Japanese, occasionally I'm thinking in English. So when someone's speaking to me in Japanese or write something, I don't switch automatically to English mode. When I'm speaking English, I can immediately think of the Fujianese self. And if I can't, I tell myself I can't. Like, uh, oh, I don't have a word for this. I don't know. I I'm trying to like, it's, it's a lot of feelings going around here. Here's something that is interesting in your situation when it comes to English. I have an internal monologue and talk to myself, but with Japanese, you don't have that. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, in Japanese. I see. You don't have an internal monologue in Japanese with yourself. But do you have an internal monologue with English when you're using Japanese? That is still so something that is worth noting, in my opinion. It's just feeling it's just feelings that come out as words at the moment of communication. I, I have an internal monologue right now uh, since I'm 
learning Japanese. I don't have an internal monologue with Japanese. However, I do have an internal monologue with English when I'm learning Japanese. And I'm not actually doing what people suggest. As in, forget the internal monologue in English. You have to think in Japanese, learn in Japanese, get input in Japanese. My root, my root to Japanese, like being comfortable with Japanese, is having an internal monologue, period. As in, if I'm not able to think internally as a Japanese monologue, I use broken Japanese with English monologue. So, like, for example, like when I was talking to you, like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, Pasokon, uh, Pasokon no uh, battery. Because I have no idea, right now, off the top of my head, there's no hesitation. I don't know what it is, but I know I know the uh, word for battery. And you can see that when I'm writing, I'm actually writing in English when I'm saying and vi visualizing in kana. So the thing is, it's all mixed a lot of times. Like sometimes I would do something like, well, ashita. And then I, I wanted to write tomorrow, but I wrote ashita in Odomaji, right? In Odomaji. But from time to time, it's like, oh, okay, well, ashita. Ashita is fine too. You can do this if you want, right? This is ashita. So that's what I mean by that. Like, it's not like I'm spending time looking for these things. It's, it, it goes back and forth. Like, ashita, ashita, tomorrow. To me, that's what I'm trying to illustrate. I don't think you need to necessarily compartmentalize that. If you have a background like me, like, for example, if you're always constantly in this uh, environment where you constantly have to interpret, I think removing this and forcing yourself to do something, even though the in your environment keeps reinforcing, I think that's not leveraging what you do or have to do a lot, in my opinion. So uh, I like talking to people who are in those situations to see if they feel the same way. If they have these like feelings or etc because that's actually very rare it's it's actually a lot rarer than some people might think uh gabriel uh so what is my daytime what is my daytime job i don't have a job i'm i know i'm unemployed or is it just youtube if you don't mind answering i don't even know if it's just youtube i actually spend most of the time keeping people company no, no, not like that. But I usually, um, if I'm not doing this, I spend time talking to people. Um, but I turn that into a job, maybe. I don't want to turn it into a job, but it, it could be an interesting job. My job right now, at least in my opinion, is if anyone talks to me, I will try my best to make it in the, like I think currently I am very privileged and I have a lot of I'm going to say borrowed time. I have a lot of borrowed time that I can spend willy nilly choosing to engage other people. And that's probably what I'm doing right now. I, I like to uh, make people care about their lives for the time being. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, so much like you, Gabriel, you are definitely more than welcome to constantly ask questions. Because my time, I think it's best used to collect and interact with people for the time being. I don't, I think it's the most invaluable experience that allows you to set yourself up for any job in the future. Because jobs, for better or for worse, or for whatever people might say, you have to interact with other people. So if I have free time and I have the privilege of not needing to have to do something all the time, uh, I will use it to the best of my ability to achieve as much wisdom as I can by interacting with people. Then when I need to get a job, I will be prepared for those things. And it's kind of like practicing what I preach versus um, studying 
what I preach. I'm not studying communication I, anymore. I'm using it. And I'm not uh, studying how to give better presentations or studying how to be more articulate or stop using filler words and sounding monotonous, not enthusiastic. So this is the time that I'm using. And that's what the YouTube and the Twitch thing is for. I know that it can be a little deceptive. Um, in my opinion, I have thought about it if I would retitle this. Technically, learning Japanese is what I'm actually doing on Duolingo. However, it's more of a social experiment for myself to practice my communication skills and my thoughts. So whenever someone has an idea, when I'm on stream, the goal is to participate as vehemently as I can in the task at hand versus getting a job and knowing what I have to do. So this is my journey process. When I'm off stream, I'm goal oriented. I have things I have to do for the day. I have to eat by a certain amount of time. I have to consume a specific amount of calories. I have to go out and work so to preserve my cardiovascular. So outside of this is a non journey time. It's uh, getting things done. Much like work and hobby, the balance between work and hobby. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't have a day job at the moment. I've hadn't had a formal day job in the last five, five plus years. Uh, so I'm naturally like, if I had to place a resume, like fill my resume, I would say I spent the last five to six years cultivating communication skills. And then I could list all the skills that I've tangentially uh, acquired on my free time. Or I know what the position requires and I'll write those skills and I can demonstrate them in an interview or something so that I, it, it, I don't have a problem writing these skills because I could do it at any time and usually involves communication, uh, problem solving, critical thinking, and uh, you can throw in an extra language. I actually think learning another language doesn't really propel you, incentivize you in any form of job recruitment. However, the act of learning a language the commitment required to acquiring a language you can leverage that because if you can leverage doing something that doesn't give you a pragmatic return learning an extra language is diminished return i'm sorry but that's like the reality of the thing if you're an english speaker however in an interview you could leverage your planning your scheduling your time management and how you leverage all the experiences involved in the learning as a way to demonstrate to your employer that like, I might not have the exact skills you're looking for, but if you give me any amount of time, I'll do exactly what you need because I can learn something even not motivated by anything other than my own tenacity, right? And my own genuine curiosity. So that's kind of the thing. And right now, I don't have to have a job, so I'm living it up, basically, I, I suppose. Uh, I do not, unless I stumble into a feeling that I don't know how to fix. Oh, interesting. So you only use an internal monologue when you are, are stuck. I see. I'm having an internal monologue about having an internal monologue about having an internal... Oh my god, girl, please. Then English kicks me into my head and uh, kicks into my head and it essentially flips through my mental notebook to find the right. That's I think that's beautiful. Maku saw rent a friend for a day in Japan and decided to start rent an intellectual. <laughs> um, funny story. Indy is not here, but Indy really likes anime and uh, he was watching this thing and I was intellectually curious about it. And it was an anime called Rent a Girlfriend. And this stuff actually does exist as a service and you're kind of referring to that already and um in, in a different way not in the like obviously it's anime so it's hyperbolic and whatnot so it's kind of funny that you mentioned that but i have been aware of that type of concept for a while because i don't want to say this but asian cultures especially like japan and china they second line 
that type of thing for the work culture substantially it's it's something that growing up in the united states becomes so much more vivid being a uh, multicultural like my family companionship comes really hard for my for my parents and when i see like the doc like documentaries and like social analyses maybe even from a foreigner perspective when you're comparing the like in my opinion potentially non-sustainable work culture that is in asian countries like china and japan i started thinking about these things like yeah you can kind of see the pragmatic application of needing companionship right so it's kind of an interesting deep cut when you mentioned the whole rent a friend and rent an intellectual for a day and i actually think that's what makes twitch and live streaming one of the bigger things Nowadays, though, here's a slight deep cut before I really need to continue my lesson. Um, the whole idea of the desperation, even in the United States now, there's a high frequency of people using machine learning, large language models, large language models in order, in order to create internal dialogue that's external, but it's actually internal. So, um, specifically for companionship uh grief dealing with grief overcoming like you can see the void that society doesn't provide very often or maybe stigmatize very often there's a high uptrend in using large language model large language models as a substitute at least any form of substitute in order to externalize and actualize an internal monologue in order to achieve a better mental health or a support a crisis that is happening mentally right now like uh, there's spikes in trends on how to use a large language model in order to talk to uh, to overcome grief by having internal monologues of with the memory of a, a lost loved one right or the con you know trying to create elements of a lack of companionship and to me, it's a bittersweet thing. It's nice that technology is being able to offer a temporary facsimile. But at the same time, what I'm doing in my free time is like how I feel if I was in the presence of those people. Like, hey, maybe just for one day, I can give you the impression for the time being that you are important and you should go out and meet other people right there are other people who are willing to potentially be life partners and people require that and that's kind of the whole deep cut regarding this thing at least that's my sentiment it's so it's such an obvious trend what's happening um it used to be felt more so in my opinion but when i was younger it's felt more so in the Chinese culture and in the Japanese culture from afar as a foreigner even that the work culture is so dominant it's incredibly dominant that it has superseded and sidelined companionship and like self-love and you know moment to moment appreciation let's not even talk about Korea I, I've actually omitted Korea from uh, Korea from this statement because Korea is experiencing, from a foreigner perspective, is experiencing an extremely exaggerated version, in my opinion, of the outcomes and side effects of the isolationism and work culture that is pervasive in those three countries. But in Korea, it's felt even more in terms of just not wanting to seek companionship or actually maybe not being alone justifiably and ra rationalizing being alone and even potentially normalizing the lack of need for companionship food for thought i would say it's a rhetoric and i'm a foreigner so that's just my outside interpretation i love hearing people find companionship i'm surrounded by people with companions so that's kind of nice at least in my opinion i must be doing something behaviorally correct if i can like take a jab at sub-zero and his relationship with his uh his 
which sounds like a really an adorable girlfriend. And then Lotus uh, freely talked about his companion, right? And then you, Shady. So I must at least be pre-selecting something and be hitting, be like intuiting some way of selecting for people who understands that companionship is beautiful. It's incredibly beautiful. It's also lots of compromises, but I, I am very close to a couple of sprouts, you know, like much younger than me, at least 10 years younger than me, that I must collect more experience in order to like, they want companionship. But the idea is wanting and knowing it's not enough to substitute for outputting and practicing. And that's kind of what I feel about the internet right now. It's an easy escape. It, it doesn't substitute for life skills like communication, problem solving, critical thinking. That is pretty much the foundation of interacting with another human being. Not even language learning. It's actually pretty ironic. I, I was surprised, in my opinion, in the last 83 days that the vast majority of my interactions with other language learners, oh, it's almost paradoxical how emotionally unintelligible their understanding of the language they use. Like, I don't have to understand Japanese to understand that this person has undeveloped communication skills. They can help me and translate and help me learn more Japanese. But I've all, in my opinion, earnestly, I'm concerned for their use and motivations for what language is. Like, language is a vehicle for expression. Not, in my opinion, if these, these people appear very in, intelligent, incredibly intelligent, but they lack emotional intelligence. Like, the motivation for language, the motivation for cultural understanding. They understand the concepts of the culture and the concepts of the rules, but n rarely an application of the things they work hard on. And for me, I like to point that out because it's, it's even more, in my opinion, it's even beautiful. It can be even more beautiful than simply a checklist of uh, proficiency in the language. Language itself and culture itself, it's beautiful. It allows you to reach companionship. It allows you to reach emotional intelligence between competent people with shared intellectual commonality. Yet, much like yesterday's digression about Duolingo and the greater language learning community, it is surprisingly worse than like say a gaming community i don't know like a souls community or a os community like a rhythm game community it's it's still surprisingly so much more detached and it's a learning community versus a enjoyment community right a pleasure community so oh i was surprised i thought maybe there would be a difference but i didn't think it was going to be this difference i do think fundamentally humans are social creatures at least that's my dogma it's my paradigm that i operate in uh, a lot of people could fight me and say oh i'm a lone wolf i'm a whatever that's that's fine i i respect that as long as they're happy i cannot sit by if they're like slowly draining themselves of their happiness in their lives and having this cultural dissonance or this cognitive dissonance. I wouldn't stand by then. However, if you're clearly happy, I wouldn't get in the way of that. I'm glad that I waited to get involved in a relationship until I was 28 because I feel like I personally would not have been emotionally mature enough to be in a relationship to the level I would, okay, I would want to be if I had to jump in early. That's fair. That's very uh, reflexively wise. Uh, needed a lot more communication skills and self-confidence slash work on your own mental health. Yeah, before accepting someone else into your life. Yeah, um, I obviously don't like I can't fully resonate with um, being 
uh, intimate with another person. However, I st I would even step back and treat that in most of my relationships, right? Like a teacher-student relationship, for example. My approach to teaching comes at the idea that if my own mental health and my ability to communicate and the confidence that I can project and be accommodating, if it's not a net positive, like it's it's dependent on something, I am not ready for that position to elevate someone else. If I do not have energy and mental health and stability to give because I'm already struggling with my own, then I would step back. And I understand that sounds like a place of privilege. And I wasn't always privileged. My family worked really hard for it to provide as much privileges. And then I overcome a lot of things. But when I reach that state, it feels so great to be able to do that. So that's kind of going back to the original question. To the original question. That's why I summarize. I don't have a day job right now. But since I have so much excess maybe inner energy or things I can do, I might as well make it so I can share and give something. Oh, which by the way, oh man, my digressions are going very long. Uh, John, speaking of John Green from yesterday, John Green actually encapsulated this idea in a different way. Just today, he posted something called A Secret to Art. A Secret to Art. You as a creator, you as a creator, like for myself, this is my art. My art is to emphasize communication, uh, mental health, right? Uh, problem solving and critical thinking. And it is a gift that I'm trying to give. However, the magic that happens, that generosity, he used, specifically used the word generosity. So out of the generosity that I'm able to give, as in my mental health is great, I have excess things to give. I create that generosity, which is live streaming and YouTube videos, and I give it out there. But it is not in itself sufficient to create magic that resonates with a lot of people. It is when it is completely dependent, obligatorily dependent on another person this is where humans are social creatures another person to stop and look and say hey i have ideas too and let's share together and you have this mutual generosity that is the moment when magic happens humans are incredible in that they are often, when this happens, the magic amplifies beyond the sum of their parts. It's an emergent, it's an emergent quality that I absolutely love. And that in itself is kind of encapsulating a wonderful human relations in like couples, right? Couples, you know, love between like uh, parents and children significant others that type of thing and he actually literally talked about this subject that i was talking i was deferring to yesterday and john green was talking about it in the context of his movie turtles all the way down uh, or the movie based on his book and how like nerf nerf iteria and like the people it was the magic combination of the mutual generosity uh multiple humans coming together exchange Exchanging ideas, willing to discuss, is what when the magic happens. Uh, as much as you want to be a lonely loner, I think it fails in comparison to the magic of humans resonating together. You notice this a lot. A lot of Chinese people, when you order in Chinese restaurants, are so cold for some reason. Uh, there's so much to unpack in that, but yes. It can be like that, uh, Gabriel. Especially if the uh, the management is uh, under lots of stress. Um, it is incredibly stressful. My folks 
fought a lot when they ran restaurants. They're Fujianese people, so they ran multiple Fujianese restaurants. And when times and privileges do not come, um, their stress can be very hard to contain. So, like, if you're a negative five in your house, the best someone can do is probably bring it up to a zero. And then when you go to work at a zero, then cold, cold and detached is still better than negative, negative and projection. So instead of being angry and frustrated at work, the common, the common type of uh, pragmatism that is driven by Chinese households is to at least maintain zero, as in do not project your frustrations. But rarely in an immigrant family, at least, that doesn't have a lot of privileges, you can elevate to a positive, to a positive work environment. So for me, I keep recognizing that I have lots of privileges. With that privilege, I want to give people who are at zero or negative a chance at being positive. And that's kind of a, a little deeper cut into why sometimes when you go to a Chinese restaurant, uh, you can probably get very cold because pragmatism is probably trying to normalize something that is probably negative right now. Um, when you enter a restaurant and they're really positive, like happy to you, then it's actually way more than the professionalism. Professionalism tends to be a little bit cold and detached because you don't want to be angry in, in response. Like cold smiles, politeness for the sake of being polite, right? Saying your Japanese is great, but you don't really mean it. Sorry, that's a meme, but actually it's not just Japanese people, in my opinion. Uh, Chinese people do it as well. The idea of politeness to cover up negativity, right? You don't show that in public. There's so much social pressures to maintain neutral. The cold is still better than malicious or, you know, projecting. Meanwhile, other more expressive work cultures can have fluctuation. You can have sunshine and rainbows or people just having a bad day. So they lash out at you or give you attitude. So generally cold means you're at zero. They're not trying to be your friend, but they're also not trying to make you angry. That's at least in my opinion, the the diff a big notable cultural difference between the Asian work ethic, like Chinese work ethic, and more where I'm more used to, which is the Americanized diversity. And to me, how I uh, tolerate or deal with that is Americans use euphemisms like, oh yeah, that guy must be having a hard time. Like, let's cut the guy some slack because we know that that's kind of the cultural norm. When someone's having a bad day, sometimes it leaks out, right? So for me, as a person who tries to exercise com compassion as much as I can, if I'm positive, I can absorb this person's frustration. Like maybe even tell the waiter like, wow, you must be really busy today. Do you, are, are you going to be okay? Like in no rush, please. And then you can kind of see like the waiter going around like really, it's like, take your time. I'm like. I'm positive, I have privileges, so take your time, that kind of thing. It, it, sometimes that goes a long way, right? However, in Chinese culture and Japanese culture, you can't show any of that. You can't actually even show that you have a bad time or a good time. It comes with pros and cons. You might be able to meet someone who turns your day around, but that's kind of the cultural difference between East and West a lot of times. Uh, needed a lot. Of, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I am noticing that at my job now with some of the other people at the same level as I am having worked up to the level I am at now has set me up for success in many more areas of my life than just my marriage. Yeah. You had a moment like that at Starbucks today. Could tell the guy had a bad day and when they ran out of something I had ordered on the app, he was panicked and I was like, no, it's fine. Yeah, just give me whatever else is easiest. And he thanked me afterwards. I think that stuff basically makes my heart weep. Like, 
if to me that's one of the things that cold calculated mannerism may not be able to accentuate right because if someone keeps telling you daijobu desu daijobu desu and then you clearly see that they're panicking right i can you can even have it's really obvious when you watch native japanese people talk about how like people panic when they're talking languages and stuff so it's obvious to them however the decorum dictates that you suck it up and deal with it right so in the united states after a while you get a different perspective sometimes if you it also allows people who are in a position of privilege to be like you know what my man slow down i'll cover this like that kind of thing so there's pros and cons definitely pros and cons i'm not suggesting that uh japanese people don't have a way to normalize theirs they cope and do certain problem solve that type of situation in their own way in the united states though the example that you said shady is like the thing that i like to highlight when it comes to what makes me American, as in parts of me are not cold calculated pragmatism. Like, uh, for example, it, it, this sounds cold, but it, it's the pragmatism that makes Chinese people successful. Like, oh, your business isn't going, uh, going well, suck it up and fix it. Like you're clearly doing these things wrong. Go and do a better job. As opposed to like, hey, you know what? I have some extra time. How about we work on this problem together? Like your problem is my problem, right? So let's, I have some extra time. In, instead, of, uh, instead of saying like, oh, if they're successful, they're gonna learn to work that out. Like, it's not my problem. I'm going to save them the courtesy. It's not my problem. I don't want to deal with their business. I don't want to get up all in their business. It could be offensive because they didn't. So it's kind of like the biggest contrast that I can see so often. And being raised American, being raised American, it has come with elements of mix and tug and pull. Like sometimes I ask myself, am I interloping? Like... I don't want to undermine this person's autonomy over their own business and stuff. At the same time, in the Chinese manner, it's like, well, if it's going to fail, it's going to fail because they're failures, right? So if they don't want to see how to make it work, that's their problem. And then the American side is like, ah, oh, but it could be disrespectful if I like tell them what to do or like try. So it's always back and forth. But to me, when things just work because someone came up and said it's okay breathe it, it sounds so sappy but i don't I, I personally think it's a balance you need a balance of both but in chinese culture and probably in japanese culture and and possibly korean culture like the representatives ones um there's not enough there's not even that like it, it's so few and in between you don't you don't have people like this person fumbles and say like oh i can't speak english like let me pay it's like dude dude can can i express something to you like please take your time like i'm a foreigner and i know that you have this uh, way but hey it's purely okay but can i express that is it possible to express that right that's that's kind of why language is an interesting thing but i i love i'm sappy for those type of things and that's kind of what makes me american a lot of times my parents and i do not see eye to eye with that type of thing like if the waiter screw up the waiter screwed up like that's their job they're paid to do that and and that fear usually is the standard that allows asians to be so consistent it's a fear of disappointment. I talked about this a little bit way, way back. Uh, I, I talked about it in the context of Fujinese, like Chinese people, a face culture. The fear of screwing up is what creates consistency. Not the excellence of striving to better yourself individually or communicatively. Oftentimes, what supersedes all of that is the fear of shame and disappointment. 
the United States, well, you trip and you make mistakes. I help that person and say, we all make mistakes sometimes. Let's let's try it again, right? Kind of thing. So it's constantly a duality between the two. And how do I learn Japanese? I I learn it like I'm an American, like an English speaker, not like a Japanese speaker. But the irony here is most English speakers want to be Japanese. So they approach language learning like Japanese. You must get the right pitch accent first. You must get the right grammars first. You must get etc. It, it's like a funny microcosm for Japanese culture being bleeded into the fandom of Japanese. And it's it's funny, it's smi like I smile about it and it's poetic, but I don't approach learning without making mistakes. It's a big cultural difference. <laughs> it's a really, I had a, my, my parents have a friend who is of the native of the Chinese culture. And they asked me like, how do you deal with it? Like, how do you deal with being afraid of making mistakes? Right? Uh, they say like, oh, you know, like I was doing my taxes and I like went through my taxes over and over again. Like I'm so afraid of making mistakes. Like, and I get so angry with myself and yeah, I have an entire internal dialogue and I'm like, it's, it's very understandable. Like based on the person's background. Right. So I tell them like, why, why do you think it's a mistake? Like what I mean is, um, how does the mistake make you feel bad about it? Right? Like, if you feel bad about every mistake you make, it, can I ask you, is it reasonable to live your entire life without making mistakes? Like, if you're letting fear drive your inability, if it's like making you dysfunctional in random tasks, I like to emphasize she's part of, she's an interracial couple, by the way. So her husband shares an entirely different cultural perspective. Her husband's French. So he, Honestly says, and maybe she just needed to hear from another person as well, like together. But we both, her husband and me, we expressed the idea like, if this is being dysfunctional for you, let's try to externalize what a mistake is. Maybe it's something you do to your best of your ability only to make yourself grow and improve for the next time. That isn't a bad mistake. That's a work in progress. Like if you make mistakes, it means you have opportunities to improve, right? That is the contrast between it because her uh, husband is from a westernized culture where you get these things. And that's kind of like the pressure that I constantly see in Asian cultures, especially for myself. I, I feel my sister and I can both agree on this where uh, we have a time where we could levy leverage the two different cultures in this respect to live a more sustainable worth ethic and mental health i truly do worry that in the future places like ja japan and places like china do not have sustainable work uh, work culture it's like the demands keeps going up and the new generation is not equipped to do that, at least in the deep cut, or so speak. You used to hate working in customer service because there are so many disrespectful people out there. Yeah, it can vary dramatically. Bags are 20 cents here, and I recommend asking this one guy, do you want a bag as well? And he said, yeah, by, but I won't pay for it while being dead serious. That's one of the big cultural differences between your partner and you. If we go somewhere and I can tell that someone's having a bad day, it's affecting their work. His point of view is, so? They need to do their job. Yeah, the strong cultural difference. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's how that turns out. And my partner was also making dinner one night and when he messed up on part of it, he was incredibly upset with himself. Yep. And I had to relay him that that's completely fine. Yeah. and. I would play along. I would well, not really play along. I would even go as far as saying, hey, look, maybe we change it to something even and like turn, like look at the thing. It might be something even different. Like, hey, why, why don't we like, and then 
you can contribute something to it and it becomes a new thing between you like isn't that great that if you hadn't screwed up right if you hadn't messed something up we wouldn't have this new thing that we can share together isn't that great or like hey um it's kind of like the misery deserves company but in a constructive way like oh uh, oh you broke the glass that's you know like uh one time i remember um uh, my chinese side would be so furious uh so furious about where like my sister would like say drop something and i'm like look it's broken now 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 it's useless like why, why are you so incompetent kind of thing when i was a younger kid i was so belligerent because standards were really high like you have to hold yourself to high standards nowadays when i think if someone broke something say hey hey don't don't throw it away yet is it important to you i mean it is important to me too so let's see what we can do with those broken pieces let's go make something out of it you break something you don't necessarily fix it you can change it into something that leads to new things so when you make a mistake you're not making a mistake because it's there to fix technically it's there to help you grow you change your mistakes contribute to something in the future if you hadn't made that mistake you do not create the subsequent actions for it that is critical thinking and problem solving duolingo does not do certain things i change that into those things or anything that people advise me so i'm not looking solely on what it can't do for me i'm looking for what it can do for me and what i can use it to make something else so if you screw up i'm going to ask you how do you use that if you failed to stick with japanese how can i convince you that you can use that experience to try again if they really want right or hey now they're moving on to chinese because they gave them japanese my first question is what did you learn from japanese why did you quit can you understand those things take it with you they are valuable failing something is not invaluable it is not a waste of time and that's my perspective that has changed over time when i was a kid if you do it wrong you're a failure it's unacceptable you did it you did it incorrectly my family my parents still kind of have that type of perspective growing up in this like there are right ways and wrong ways to do things there are acceptable ways ideal ways and disagreeable ways and perhaps ways that don't make you happy you can do you can work with that you can work with a lot of things i tend to work with people with poor mental health so naturally you can't just tell someone like oh you're broken beyond repair like uh, sorry sorry like sorry you came to me but if everyone gave up on you me too i you're you're a helpless case that's a perspective that you cannot in my opinion have when you're talking to another human being right so you got to learn how to problem solve you got to come up with all the techniques you can think of so that's why i do what i'm doing and not doing a day job because i don't need a day job at the moment i'm collecting things I'm collecting people who hate me. I collect people who despise me. I collect people who might be neutral to me, that kind of thing. All that stuff. If you can connect to someone who absolutely hates you for doing what you stand for, man, I think that's a win in my book. You know, I always, Gabriel, you know, I always struggle with this. Sometimes I wonder if I should do something in one go or if I should take breaks. But every time I take breaks, I feel like I'm wasting time. Yeah, that's. But if you if, if I try and go uh, all out, I never finish it and get burnt out fast. Yeah, that's the all or none situation. Um, that's a if you cannot find that sustainable for your life, I would suggest being able to do things 
but have some way of imbuing value into when you're not doing the thing you're focused on. So like, for example, when the whole taking a break and wasting time, that's a very common aspect or mindset of younger people, like especially ambitious people. Um, you have to think of it in like uh, an alternative way to do it is um, if I knew this person, I would tell him, hey, you want to go on a road trip for a weekend? And I would try my best to demonstrate that how that road trip, that break is a forward investment in being able to do the thing you're going to do when you come back. So naturally, some of the closer friends, like I have someone who I know personally for the last four or five years who have gotten exceptionally much more accepting and better at utilizing breaks, understanding that they need a break. And when they come back, they actually benefit from that break. It rejuvenates them. So it's very common for this person to accept how to maximize breaks, know when that you're getting diminished return from burnout, complacency, repetitious nature, habit formation, all that, and breaking actually only improved their output over time. So that's kind of one of the things that you start with when you encounter lots of ambitious people, uh, when they start feeling like they can't help themselves like treat yourself to anything without feeling guilty about it and i think the internet hustle culture definitely contributes to that substantially contributes to that feeling where if you're not doing something you're wasting time and i think that perfectly exemplifies the most extreme case and i think it's like the japanese war culture uh, a lot of times uh, from a foreigner perspective um I was not successful predicated on the idea that I burned myself out. I think I was far less successful when I was closer to burning out than anything. Um, you can burn as bright, brightly as you can, but eventually you're going to burn out. And all that time you lost burning out can be a vicious cycle. Not only do you feel like you don't need to take a break and you're wasting time, when you burn out, you have to take a break only to feel like you're wasting time and you don't have the capacity or choice to continue working through your breaks. So it's a really strong, big midlife crisis or crises point waiting to happen. At least that's my opinion. Um, some people are very, very lucky. So on the internet, if you ever see someone like that, first of all, you have to question yourself, what do you see and what you don't see? Because that person could be burning out and being really miserable behind the scenes and that's happened so many times some of the most successful early people burn out and realize that their health is not doing so well and then there are the ones that are successful and what they do is they walk away when they know it's time to walk away and then come back when it's time to come back and those are the people that i'm talking about at least for myself i feel like i'm one of those people as in why don't I have a day job right now? I learned to take a break and walk away. And what do I do while I'm doing that? Leisurely doing things that make me feel like I'm not wasting my time. What's a great way to not waste time when I don't have a day job? Well, probably trying to reach out and helping as many people as possible. Because much like what Shady said is that my reputation and credibility and how lucky I am and privileged in my life was due to the fact that I continue to trust that the more people I help or resonate with or like continue to reach out, the more likely that one of those people will become superstars. And maybe, just maybe, we can work together to create magic. And my privilege, the privilege that I have now is built on a forward investment. I burned out helping people. That's all I can really describe about it. I burned out having sacrificed or quote unquote, being so addicted to feeling, making sure that I'm useful to a lot of people that it became a blessing in disguise. And I like to emphasize that it could happen to you 
I personally wouldn't gamble it. I prefer to encourage people to have a sustainable way of life that has some sort of companionship, support system, while trying to maintain a work culture that might be not so ideal. Nowadays though, I think younger people are exposed to this after the fact so many times. On YouTube, what you see are people who are already successful. You are likely to be seeing people who are already successful. They already have privileges. Like myself. Like, yes, I'm not like some viral TikToker or streamer, but the way that I can do this, going back to your original question, is that I already have privileges. And I want to make sure people know that I have those privileges. I'm not an expert. I don't do anything like professionally anymore. So um, I like to make people aware that when you're constantly exposing to yourself to images of success and images of I can do that too and whatnot, those people are already successful. They are already privileged. So when you're chasing a moving target, it can be very disheartening and it can make it feel like you're always wasting your time because you're always behind. Everything always feels like you're always behind. At least that's the phrasing I hear a lot. Oh, like, man, I got to do this quickly. If I don't get it done this quickly, then I, I'm, a, I'm a failure, that kind of thing. Uh, time is not the same, right? If you're thinking about it as endpoints, specific points on the thing, on a timeline, you no longer have any appreciation for what you can do with that time, the time in between. A successful runner knows how to rest and relax during their breaks and then know when to train, right? A sustainable runner. A runner who wants to be a superstar could be someone who only lasts for three years or for, for probably the remainder of their life. I don't know. In this case, I like to make life more of a marathon than a sprint. You can definitely get lucky if you're willing to sacrifice that. I don't think burnout is worth it, personally.